Welcome to this symposium, which is a united approach for impactful HIV care. This symposium is supported by funding from Gilead Canada. These are our disclaimers and disclosures. The content in this symposium has been developed independently by myself, Maluba Habanama, Gareth Henry, Dr. Knox, and Dr. Le Boucher. We would like to begin this discussion with acknowledging the lands that we live and work on. Myself, Gareth Henry, and Dr. Knox live and work in Toronto, the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Ishnebek, and the Haudenosaunee, and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Dr. Le Boucher lives and works in Montreal, the traditional territory of the Kiknaha, on whose traditional territories we build homes, lives, and communities. We all acknowledge and are grateful that we get to live and work on this land and are all settlers to this land. So let's begin. Again, my name is Maluba Habanyama. I am the Senior Manager of Advocacy at the Teresa Group in Toronto, Ontario. I would also like to welcome my fellow panelists, Dr. Le Boucher, who is an Associate Professor at the Department of Family Medicine, Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. I would also like to welcome Dr. Knox, an HIV primary care physician at the Maple Leaf Medical Clinic in Toronto, Ontario. And finally, I would also like to welcome Gareth Henry, the Executive Director at the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention in Toronto, Ontario. Welcome to all the panelists. So the program objectives for today in this discussion is that at the end of this program, participants will hopefully be able to apply strategies to access and implement a holistic management of quality of life indicators. They will also be able to discuss the therapeutic goal of effective treatment management for long-term success. And finally, they should be able to provide guidance on social strategies to address stigma and promote a discrimination-free society. Today, we will be discussing and asking the very important questions of, what does HIV in Canada look like today? And how has it improved? What is the impact of treatment? And how is this improving quality of life parameters? What does lifelong continuity of care look like? And finally, stigma and discrimination still remain. So moving forward, how can we improve and remove stigma and discrimination in the future? Dr. Knox, I would like to pose this question to you. What does HIV look like in Canada today and how has it improved? Thank you for the introduction, uh, Maluba, and the question, and thank you to Gilead for inviting me to participate today. So what does HIV look like in Canada today? The HIV epidemic in Canada looks different depending on where in the country you're looking. The Public Health Agency of Canada 2020 surveillance highlights show that the lowest rates of new HIV diagnoses in Canada in 2020 were seen in Atlantic Canada, the Territories, and British Columbia while the highest rates of new HIV diagnoses was seen in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Quebec. What's driving the epidemic differs geographically with major risk factors being injection drug use in some provinces, compared to being a man who has sex with men being the major identified risk factor in other provinces. In 2020, there were 1,600 new HIV diagnoses in Canada, and this gives us a national rate of 4.3 per 100,000 population, which is down 21% from 2019. Now, the pandemic certainly has been responsible for that decrease. Uh, there was decreased access to STI screening and treatment uh, during the first part of the pandemic, and I would argue actually probably even still. And I can tell you that despite public health messaging to stay at home, uh, there was a lot of sex that was happening throughout the pandemic. Primary care providers saw lots of syphilis and other bacterial STIs throughout the pandemic, and there was no public health messaging on harm reduction for sexual practices that are intimately tied to substance use disorders and so sex, uh, that, so sex was further stigmatized and driven underground. So I suspect we're gonna see an increase in HIV diagnoses in the 2021 and 2022 surveillance reports. We can zoom in a little closer and have a look at the demographics of individuals newly diagnosed with HIV in 2020. Of the 1600 new HIV diagnoses, 28.6 were among those identifying as females and 71.4 were among those identifying as males. For adult females, 65.8% had a risk factor of heterosexual contact, 
32.7% were among those who inject drugs. For adult males, 60.8% were among those who reported male-to-male -male sexual contact, 21.8% to heterosexual contact, and 12.8% among those who injected drugs. 3% among those who reported both male-to-male -male sexual contact and injection drug use. Uh, one third of those uh, new infections uh, in both males and females occurred in the ages of uh, 30 to 39, which is stable from previous reports. And one fifth of new infections were among those aged 50 years of age and older, which is a good reminder to patients, which is a good reminder to ask patients who are 50 and older about both current risk factors for HIV and historical risk factors for HIV. So how has HIV care improved? I decided to look back to the year that I started practicing uh, HIV primary care, and that was 2014, which seems like very recently, but was actually eight years ago. And I looked at the DHHS guidelines for the treatment of HIV. So in 2014, first-line antiretroviral therapy recommendations included NNRTI-based regimens like Atripla, the protease-based regimens Adazanivir and Darunavir, and the first-generation integrase inhibitor Raltegravir. And at that time, the second generation integrase inhibitor, dolutegravir, was relatively new on the scene and wasn't being prescribed that frequently yet. And if we compare this to the DHHS guidelines for 2021, uh, they recommend that most people who are newly diagnosed with HIV be started on a second generation integrase-based regimen, namely bictegravir or dolutegravir. Now, there is a section in the guideline that suggests that for certain uh, clinical scenarios, you can consider other um, regimens, and those include NNRTI-based regimens, protease inhibitor regimens, and long-acting injectable medications like rilpivirine and cavotegravir. So we have plenty of options. So that's how the medication guidelines have changed, but how does this actually translate to the clinic? Uh, we have access to over 30 different antiretroviral medications in Canada currently, and we can tailor that regimen to the patient in front of us after we consider their antiretroviral history, uh, resistance history, medical comorbidities, patient lifestyle factors, and patient preferences now for oral versus long-acting injectable medications. Uh, the medications we have access to now have better side effect profiles, both long-term and short-term. And they're very powerful medications with high barriers to drug resistance and sustained virologic suppression. Uh, decreased pill burden with many single tablet regimens available. In fact, most patients today who are diagnosed with HIV can be managed with one pill once a day. And we can look at how far we've come with HIV treatment, but we also have to look toward where we need to go. Uh, we can use the joint United Nations 95, 95, 95, 95 target framework to uh, look at this. So the combination prevention options for people who are at risk of HIV, we need to improve sexual education among uh, our youth and young adults in Canada. Um, STI screening and treatment and making it more available, uh, increasing access to barrier methods, PrEP, and harm reduction strategies. And I would argue that we need to provide a lot of medical education to healthcare providers around PrEP and harm reduction strategies as well. In terms of diagnosis, uh, the last data I saw on this was from the PHAC report from 2018, which suggested that 13% of people living with HIV in Canada are unaware of their diagnosis. So we need to improve access to STI screening and HIV testing, including point of care at home testing. In terms of effective treatment, uh, we can improve access to antiretroviral medications and reduce financial barriers to antiretroviral medications, including copays. In terms of achieving an undetectable viral load, offering patients routine HIV viral load testing, we know that undetectable means untransmittable. We need to address uh, side effects of medications that affect patients' compliance to antiretroviral medications and address mental health and substance use uh, in our patient populations that also impact their compliance. So Maluba, that's my very quick take on HIV care today, what's going well, and what we can continue to do in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Knox. I have many reflections after your presentation. Gareth, you also work within the community and our executive director for a huge um, uh, nonprofit organization in Toronto. I'm wondering what your quick reflections are on Dr. Knox's presentation. Thanks, uh, Dr. Maxwell, that uh, sharing the, um, that presentation just now. But no, the piece now is what I want to say. We always have to input a piece to acknowledge the the, the the where we have come from and where we are today, 
Uh, you know, even though things don't, uh, doesn't remain, uh, is not necessarily the best or uh, at perfection, there's been some positive growth and improvement and, you know, in terms of the access to multiple different um, um, uh, medications that we can choose to, to take uh, for our health um, and to suppress HIV. For me, on a personal level, uh, that that's a huge and significant significant kind of a, uh, uh, improvement, and which has helped me to to maintain uh, undetectable viral load uh, for for years. We need to have more doctors in our communities that uh, specialize in HIV treatment and care uh, for us to be able to move in the direction that we want to move. Now. Thank you so much, Gareth. Definitely, and you talked in, about something uh, like correlating that it's the specialists in the medical field, also with the community, that I think is the reason why we have improved so much, and why I believe we will improve in the future as well. Dr. Lebouche, I'm wondering what your reflections as well is on our improvements and how we could improve in the future as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Moluba. Uh, I think uh, my colleague David Knox uh, explained very well the, the, the situation in Canada for, for, for HIV and, and the difference between the province. And depending where you live in the province, uh, the challenge are different. And as Garrett explained very well also, uh, we have, sure, we have excellent uh, antiretroviral therapy actually, but you need HIV doctor, you need access to this therapy. So if you need HIV doctor, it means that, you know, we have a lot of uh, several HIV doctors will be retired soon. So we, we need a new generation of HIV doctors. And also we need a new generation of HIV healthcare provider, you know, because the people living with HIV are still here. So we, they need care and they need specific care uh, who answer to their needs. I'd love to know, Dr. Lebouche, what is the impact of treatment and how is this improving quality of life parameters? So thank you, Maluba, for, for your question. So uh, what is the impact on quality of life? So it, it's very important because it means that we, we need to, to better integrate the, the perspective of people living with HIV. So if we need uh, treatment success, it means that we need treatment success in the long term. You don't take antiretroviral therapy just for one or two months. You take antiretroviral therapy possibly for 10, 12, 20, 30 years, okay? Possibly more. So the long-term success means minimal, no treatment burden. And we know that we have several challenges for that. Uh, normally we explain, okay, it's important to have an uh, open conversation about adherence. And uh, if there is some trouble, how we can adapt treatment. But sometimes it's difficult to discuss about adherence. It's not so fancy to discuss, oh, I have trouble, I don't take my treatment. I have trouble to take my treatment. Uh, it's difficult. So, um, and during the consultation, uh, sometimes the clinician, he, he doesn't have, or she doesn't have enough time to discuss that with, uh, with, with the patients. Also, uh, we want to uh, optimize how often viral load needs to be checked. You know, uh, actually, even with the uh, uh, recommendation, the DHHS recommendation in the in United States, uh, you can do um, viral load if you are very stable every six months or every year. But sometimes my, my patient told me, oh, I would love to check my uh, HIV viral load regularly to be sure I'm still undetectable, to be sure I will uh, not transmit the virus to, to my partner. So can I check uh, my HIV viral load when I want to do that? And our last challenge, it's important also to monitor for toxicity, but not only uh, toxicity uh, in the perspective of the clinician, who, toxicity who are reported by the clinician, but also uh, toxicity were reported by uh, our patients who they say, okay, I think this treatment is toxic for me or as I have trouble with this treatment. So it's important also to give the possibility to, the, to our patient to, to report this uh, perceived uh, toxicity of their antiretroviral therapy or potential toxicity. And as uh, my colleague David uh, explained before, we have real clinical success in HIV care for sure. And right? if we if we see the 
uh, how we, we went in uh, the uh, early uh, 80s and now in uh, uh, 2022, uh, actually, uh, uh, we have a, a lot of single treatment regimen with three therapy or dual therapy. And if we can evaluate what is the optimal combination, actually, and I take with oral therapy, uh, the optimal combination is to have a high rate of viral suppression, to have all the medication in one pill per day, uh, less toxic, to have um, improved tolerability, so really minimal burden during the daily life to a, a very good uh, tolerability, very few drug-drug uh, interaction if we take other uh, treatment. So it's like a neutral antiretroviral therapy. Uh, very convenient. We can take it uh, when we want, during the day or during the night, and a very high barrier to resistance. So even if sometimes to take the antiretroviral therapy is a bit chaotic, okay, the, uh, the treatment is strong, and we will continue to stay undetectable. And, but we have new challenge, and you can see uh, with this graph of the cascade of care in, in Canada, it was in uh, 2018, and actually we, we saw that 94% uh, of people on treatment have a suppressed viral load. And it's uh, thanks to the uh, efficacy of this treatment and the convenience to take this treatment. And possibly in my clinic, around 90% of my patients are undetectable. Yes, it's good, but, but possibly it's not an house and we need to go beyond undetectability. What does it mean to go beyond undetectability? It means that despite very efficient and convenient antiretroviral therapy, uh, despite viral suppression, what we say that people living with HIV often report a poor well-being, a poor health-related quality of life. So what can we do? I think possibly it's time to get more metrics of success. Not only ICD-4, not only HIV viral load, which is undetectable, but it's time for optimal HIV care using both hands. So the clinical hand, the left hand, and the, uh, the right hand of people living with HIV would take this treatment. So what is the left hand? The left hand is our clinical immunovirologic marker, huh? CD4 cell count, HIV viral load, and also clinical trials. But we know that with clinical trials, most of the time, we, it's underrepresent uh, the population which is living with HIV. So we need to, to include a more uh, diversity in our clinical trials if we want uh, that this result of these clinical trials will be really the mirror of what we will get during our daily clinical practice. So that's why also we need the right hand. The right hand, what it means? It means that we need to develop patient-reported key measure of success in HIV care and treatment. It means that we need new metrics to uh, understand and to give the opportunity to our patient to evaluate their care, to evaluate their treatment, and to be able to say, okay, my, uh, I'm happy with this treatment, it works for me, it improves my quality of life, or no, it doesn't work. So we need this new matrix. So the clinician perspective, huh? as I said, HIV viral load, CD4 cell count, underrepresentation with a lack of diversity, care and support received by patients living with HIV, in clinical trials may differ, differ for what we can uh, provide during our regular HIV uh, practice. And I just want to give you three examples of long-term data. We mean that the, the antiretroviral therapy we have actually, it works very well and it works in the long term. It's three, uh, it's data from clinical trials. So we have with BFTAF. It was presented as, as the last CROI, is the American uh, uh, HIV conference. And um, uh, they uh, presented the long-term data of Bictegravir, Emtricitabine, and TAF. So it was, uh, they take uh, the data for more than 1,200 uh, uh, participants who we were uh, naive from ARC. Uh, we have actually data that uh, participant with BFTAF uh, stay undetectable for more than 98% uh, 
uh, for more than 240 weeks. And also with very few uh, uh, side effects. And it's interesting because it was participants from a lot of countries, more than 10 countries across uh, three continents and zero case of resistance. So really, it means that it's very stable uh, tree therapy, very stable, very convenient, very efficient in the long term. Also, we have data with this dual therapy with uh, dolutegravir and sweet EC. And it was long-term data of two important studies, Gemini 1 and 2. And we have data also in 144 weeks. And what we see that there is a very high level of undetectability for these participants. And also this high level of undetectability is maintained during all the length of the study. So for several years. Also, we have data with uh, doravirin-based regimen. So doravirin is a non-nucleoside. Uh, it's, it was uh, recently uh, approved in, in Canada. And um, what we can see uh, with uh, this uh, uh, two uh, data from these two randomized double-blind uh, uh, study for uh, treatment uh, naive patients, and it's data uh, after uh, 193 weeks, and we can see also that a doravirin based regimen is also very stable and obtain also a high uh, uh, rate of undetectability. So we can see with these three examples that we have a lot of combination who are very efficient and are efficient in the long term. But we know that wellness is HIV is more than viral suppression. And it's a recent article from my colleague, uh, Uh, Guaraldi uh, is an Italian uh, HIV specialist, and he explained that HIV care must move, must move beyond viral immunological outcomes, so to, beyond uh, HIV viral load, CD4 cell count, and to integrate more patient-centered outcomes. It means that we need to integrate social challenges we are faced by all patients, and also we have to integrate mental and physical health complexes. And if we can integrate all these aspects, uh, immunovirologic and patient-centered outcome, we will be able to better tailor our care to patient needs. And really, we will have a very interesting move, HIV care, and we will have new metrics to better evaluate our HIV care and our HIV treatment. So the right hand, and it's the right hand. The right hand is a patient-reported measure of metric of success. What does it mean? It means that we need to foster Um, an active participation of people living with HIV in their care for better HIV care. And we need to choose now people living with HIV oriented minimal no burden treatments. So how we can integrate this uh, uh, perspective of our patients. So we need to develop patient reported care of success in HIV care and treatment, and also patient reported metrics to evaluate this new uh, patient-reported heart success. And one example I want to take is uh, the uh, PROM we uh, recently developed. PROM is a patient-reported outcome measure. It means it's like a questionnaire with used uh, by the patient to give directly to his or her clinician uh, some uh, interesting data. So our PROM is the high score for interference score. So what is interesting with is a connected patient reported outcome measure that we developed since uh, several years. And really we want to detect some, the barrier who are perceived by our patient to uh, properly adhere uh, to their treatment. So what, what does it mean uh, for that? It means that um, we, we want to ask the concern reason why it could be difficult to take their HIV uh, medication. So just some uh, example item of the high score. Uh, it could be because it's difficult uh, to uh, take the treatment. It could be because of the social situation. It could be about your economic situation. It could be about your medication or your care or your connection with the pharmacy of your healthcare provider. All these aspects uh, could be um, Uh, could provide reason for uh, barrier to a good adherence to art. So in seven questions, we are able uh, to, um, to ask very briefly, and after this answer could be discussed with the clinician. 
So what does it mean? It means that it's really important actually because of the efficacy of our HIV care, because of the efficacy of antiretroviral therapy, it's really important to go beyond undetectability and now to develop two ends HIV care. And why to develop these two ends HIV care is to meet the need of, our, of people living with HIV and their health care provider. So we, we need a better uh, evaluation a uh, new marker of success, particularly with patient reported outcome measure. Thank you so much, Dr. Le Boucher. I am really huge on uh, the wellness of people living with HIV and what does it mean to live well um, living with HIV. It's not just about the life-saving drugs and just being undetectable. It's about the full scope of it, the wellness of care, the circle of care. Um, Dr. Knox, I'm wondering, as you are uh, a, a provider as well and an HIV specialist, what are your immediate thoughts on this and how do you um, use the two hands of HIV care within your clinic? When we see an undetectable viral load, we shouldn't assume the patient is adherent to their medication necessarily just because the viral load's undetectable. We know these medications are very powerful and even if patients are missing medications, uh, they can have an undetectable viral load. So talking to your patients about how adherent they are to their medications and understanding the barriers to you know, perfect compliance or near perfect compliance is really important. The other thing that um, struck me is the idea that um, we don't like guidelines are just guidelines and we don't have to practice by just doing viral loads every six months in our stable patients. Um, think about the patient in front of you, talk to them about what their preference is. There's something very, very powerful when a patient says to you, I need to have this viral load done every three months because of uh, I want to protect my sexual partners and myself um, and recognizing that that's what they need and providing that care. And similarly for CD4 counts, which we've um, paid so much attention to in the past, the guidelines now would suggest that, um, you know, it's optional in patients that have had high CD4 counts for many years. But that doesn't mean that the patient doesn't need to know what their CD4 count is. They don't want to know what it was five years ago. Oftentimes they're interested in their, they want to know what it is now as a measure of how um, of how well they're doing. And so I think it's very important to have these conversations uh, with patients. And it's all part of the two hand framework. And I agree. What a what a fantastic analogy. And I'm going to be using that going forward as well. And Gareth, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, for me, I think you know, what's important is is always having that interest in kind of a balance uh, um, as well, as relates to quality of life. You know, um, medication and access to medication and, and adherence is built in is built into a sense of community, a sense of belonging. People can connect and understand and be able to share their experiences and get support. Uh, you know, and that piece around mental health support and, uh, and all those kind of stuff, which is important. And speaking of quality of life, we also have to talk about what does the lifelong continuity of care look like? For me personally, um, I was born with HIV. I was born in 1993, and in 1995, when I was two years old, um, my... Uh, doctors in Ottawa found that I was diagnosed with HIV and that my mother also had HIV and that my father, who was back home in the UK, had HIV as well. Um, and so that was something to, to understand. And as I did grow, I understood what HIV was and kind of understood everybody's aspects on it. But the one thing about being a child living with HIV is that of course, your parent takes on more autonomy, your parent and your medical provider. When I was 14 years old, my father did pass away from a heart condition uh, related to not taking care of himself and, and his HIV. And that was really a lot of, uh, you know, psychological pain to go to and not understanding. And I didn't get the assistance with that. And it was kind of something that was brushed under the rug. When I was 19 years old and my mother passed away, I kind of had this, again, like psychological break. And it was like my two parents that were living with the virus died. So what does that mean for me? And it was actually at a point where I was like, I don't want to come in and see my doctor. I don't want to talk about HIV. And she, you know, to not liking that and obviously not being happy had to find a way to support me in that and actually did um, set me up with mental health support. And this is somebody who, when I first get into her clinic, she asked me how I am and what I'm doing for work before we even talk about the numbers. I've had this relationship with the specialist for a number of years. She just retired in November where I saw her and now it's March. So I, 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 I do need to get blood work and get that round. And so it is something that I think within me is like, 
like causes that anxiety, but it really is important where if I go to another specialist and you see, okay, I'm undetectable, she seems fine, am I going to be rushed within the five minutes? Every patient is different. Every client is different. Everybody wants different relationships and a different um, care of what that looks like. Finding a specialist and then also finding, um, you know, community organizations that will help. And I have to say, like, I feel like sometimes aid service organizations have, get, have given it a good benefit as well. And so that's my experience with my lifetime of care that is still progressing. I'm a 28 year old woman who has not had any children. And that's also will be a next stage in my life and what that whole um, circle of care looks like. And I'm wondering for the three of you, what are those reflections that you see within your clients, within your patients, within your community members? Um, and then what you're also seeing within yourself and your experience? Uh, Maruba, it's very it's very impressive for me how you 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 explain how you develop your expertise in HIV care in the last uh, uh, twenty eight years. It's really uh, symptomatic of what we we have actually uh, with our uh, with our patient living with HIV. It means that it's a it's a chronic condition. It means that it needs a long term self-management. Why? Because if it's a long-term uh, chronic condition, it, it means that you will see your doctor possibly one, two times a year for 20 minutes. But for the rest of the year, you will be the boss. And that's what is very, really interesting. But to be the boss, you need to get access to the right information to take the right decision. So and that's why I think ML, mobile health, can offer innovative solutions to give you more access to your data, to give you more access to verified information. And with my uh, research team in the uh, chronic virus services at the McGill University uh, Health Center in Montreal, uh, we try to, uh, to develop and to adapt uh, new tools to give to uh, our uh, HIV patients um, access to their data and to, to give them the tools for a better self-management of uh, their uh, uh, HIV care. And it's really important that these tools need to be configured not by researcher, not by the doctor, because they need to be configured to uh, answer to uh, patient needs. So that's why it's really important to have an engagement when you develop this tool with HIV patient and with their healthcare provider. So I just want to, to explain uh, one tool which is important for us is the uh, OPAL patient portal. Uh, it allow patients to give access to their electronic medical records, to, to their lab results, progress notes, appointment schedule, educational material. They can answer questionnaire, electronicpatientreporting.com, and they can have everything on their smartphone. So they can have access to their electronic medical record on their smartphone. And it's interesting because we know that it could improve a safe communication with the patient and their healthcare provider. Also, it can give the opportunity for HIV patient to get access to their medical record, so to get access to their information when they want, and not only when they need to go to the HIV clinic or to the hospital. And the OPAL solution is very interesting because it was developed by your patients. It's used by more than uh, 2,000 uh, 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 patients uh, living with a cancer. So that's why I, I wanted to just to discuss with you because really, Maluba, what, what I was really impressed by what you uh, you presented just before. And uh, but I think really the challenge we have, I have as a clinician, is how to give the right information, to give access to the right information to my patient when they need it, and not only when they see me, when they uh, discuss with me. And that's why I think this, these new tools could be a good way to give this right information and to foster a better self-management. Thank you so much, Dr. Libichet. I loved that you said, you know, you see your doctor maybe twice a year and for 20 minutes, but at the rest of the year, you're the boss. Dr. Knox, I'm wondering what your reflections are and what you see in your clinic when it comes to the circle of care and continuity of care. 
I just want to say thank you for that really powerful presentation. Really interesting to see how you navigated the healthcare system on your own. And I would suggest it sounds like ultimately you were very successful in terms of giving patients increased access um, to uh, medical information for each patient um, is something that some patients will definitely want and will contribute to their overall uh, quality of life and care. Absolutely. And Gareth, I'm wondering what your reflections are on this. You have such a vast um, experience from your personal experience, but then also working at community organizations. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, thanks. And I want to say, Malua, thanks again for sharing uh, your, your story and your experience. It's, it's amazing. And it, again, I, just, I wished for, in my work, I wish that all PHAs would be as empowered will also have the support systems around them that have empowered them to be able to make these kind of decisions. It's difficult and it's hard as you, you age, then things change, um, but you're living longer, but then you know it's, it's what next, um, right? And so I think the ongoing access to resources and community support is gonna be a critical piece into of creating that kind of a meaningful balance. So in talking about the circle of care and quality of life, I think a lot of things that does hinder people living with HIV from living a good quality life, of course, we have to talk about stigma and discrimination. What can we do in the future to eliminate stigma and discrimination? Well, first we have to go back. HIV stigma is the negative attitudes and beliefs about people living with HIV. It is the prejudice that comes with labeling an individual as part of a group that is believed to be socially acceptable. And while stigma refers to an attitude or belief, discrimination is the behaviors that result from those attitudes or beliefs. So HIV discrimination is the act of treating people living with HIV differently than those who live without HIV. So for example, my doctor knows I refuse almost to go to any emergency room, but especially of the hospital that's about five minutes away from me, a five minute walk, a two minute drive in Mississauga, Ontario, because they disclosed my status in front of the whole emergency room. So other patients could hear that I was HIV positive and I was treated in such a way that was not human, that I have had that bad experience that was even from a medical uh, provider about my HIV status. One of the resources is the HIV Ontario Stigma Index, which is a community-led, multi-site, community-based research study. Its purpose is to document the experiences of stigma from the perspective of people living with HIV and to translate these community experiences into language that can inform the decision makers and better support programs, services, and policies in mitigating the impacts of stigma. So Casey House, which is a hospital in Toronto, Ontario, for people living with HIV, conducted the Smash Stigma survey. The survey was completed by 1,600 people in, um, in between October 10th and uh, October 13th, and it revealed that 40% of Canadians would knowingly eat food prepared by people living with HIV. So that was very interesting. And then there was also 79% of millennials would be nervous or ashamed to share their health news openly. So to, to share their status or diagnosis openly. So Casey House and that did an anti-stigma campaign that is called June's Eatery, which was about 14 chefs of people living with HIV that prepared these gourmet four course meals and got some support from it. And really the main goal of that June's Eatery, while it was as a fundraising um, activity, the main goal was to essentially spash stigma and in realizing to people that, you know, you don't know who's cooking your food and HIV is not something that can be transmitted through food. So things like this and events like this and resources like this really does get to the outer world of not just us being in this HIV bubble about what is HIV now in 2022 and breaking stigma and smashing it. And it doesn't always have to be on people living with HIV. We could all do this together. So moving forward, how can we improve and remove stigma and discrimination in the future? Because we know this will benefit people living with HIV and I think society as a whole. I'll pass it on to you, Gareth. Thanks, Maluba. Yeah, and also it's important, you know, as we uh, just said a while ago, if we're able to end stigma that we will have a, a way much better um, community and space for, for people who are living with, um, with HIV and also be able to really achieve, um, you know, what we want to achieve, zero infections, right? Zero new infections. So in keeping it real, front and center, HIV may, may no longer be a death sentence, but stigma is alive and well. 
stigma thrives in, in the silence and invisibility of people's lives. And in the belief that HIV is like diabetes or the chronic disease, the fact that we have normalized it and the fact that people are living much longer, you know, again, it kind of hinders in terms of the centering uh, HIV as we, it ought to be centered. We have to keep HIV front and center with our funders, with our communities. HIV continues to be life and death issue for every person living with HIV. We need more energy and more visibility on the realities of people's lives with HIV. And so you know, it's an important piece for us to be able to, again, uh, again, I said, you know, it's front and center is an important piece, and particular for us within the, in, in, in our work and in our, and in our sector, that's a, a commitment that we, we can make and should make in making sure that we're able to get to all, um, all community members as best as possible. Silence about HIV and stigma harms black people. You know, there is no two way about that. You know, earlier on we talked about the, 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 the decline in the um, HIV infection rate uh, on a national level in terms of you know, um, that HIV is not necessarily fully on an on increase, but the numbers are declining. But what we find is that the numbers are on the increase for, for ACB and other racialized communities. So for decades, black people have been disproportionately represented in the HIV epidemic. And this is something that we all know. But when we are going to wake up to the reality that black people, indigenous and other racialized people, make up a majority of people live with HIV, and I think for the most part, we still don't have that kind of a recognition. When we promote U equals U, PrEP, that is, you know, pop, pop in one pill a day, and all those kind of great technologies, we're speaking the reality of the most privileged in our societies. Important is that, as we said earlier on, is that there is access to these resources. There's all these new technologies that are out there. But you know, who are we speaking to, right? And oftentimes, when there are barriers to access, then you know, it's, we find that you know, this own, if it's own accessible to those who are privileged, then we continue to have and we'll continue to have the challenge that we're having just now. But this is not the reality for racialized people. In fact, this type of messaging silence experiences of black and racialized people. You know, the promotion, again, of you equals you, the promotion of prep, the, the fact, the, these positive things. What you know, the fact that racialized communities, it's not been presented or it's not taken into consideration. The the varying kind of intersectionalities and the struggles and challenges that folks face, you know, it kind of made this. Um, it makes it difficult, and it also feeds into to stigma because folk, folks are going to again, you know, um, people are going to withdraw from community. People are not necessarily going to readily to embrace uh, these new technologies because they don't understand it, right? And for them, they have other competing priorities. And so the important work for us is how do we break that silence? U equals U is not a reality for black communities, right? The, in fact, U equals U creates internalized stigma for many black um, individuals. Black people hear the message that, that not having an undetectable viral load is their fault. Right, and so we, in my work, it was like, oh, so you're not undetected? How, you know, why are you not adhering? You know, it's a it's a pillar day. That's where we're at at this point in time. And so, you know, we find that not being able to have that um, 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 undetectable viral load, people retreat and feel and feel and feel bad and feel guilty. You know, yet we know that the face. The, yet we know that these same community members, black people, racialized community, face discrimination in the medical and healthcare systems in education, in employment, in housing, in every facet of society that supports everyone's undetectability. So we don't have those accessibility as we, we, we would hope to. And so when we, we promote and we engage, and we should, right, the message that we should talk about, um, you equals you. But they also, we have to also then contextualize us in terms of how we're going to provide and create access to racialized communities so that at some point in time in the equation, we can equally embrace and celebrate this new, these new, te uh, new technologies. U equals U disempowers black people. We need equitable access. We need our own language and support around viral load suppression. To end stigma, we must have equitable access. We need to acknowledge the, the systemic impacts of anti-black racism on black people. Healthcare, education, housing, employment, Dis discriminate black people every day. And the only way to end HIV, to end stigma, is for black people to have equitable access to medical care, HIV treatment, support, and education. We need to invest in communities that are the most impacted. We need to invest in black, 
communities, black organizations, black leaders. And not just for one year or not for two years, but until HIV is eradicated. We must empower and support black people around disclosure. We need to address the internalized stigma of black people and its intersections and with anti-black racism and other forms of oppression. Black people need to be given real opportunities to empower themselves about HIV, their HIV status. Black people need to be given real opportunities to connect to and get support from their communities. This is not about forcing anyone to disclose, but it's empowering black people to reclaim the, their power around their HIV status. Another important piece, we must balance prevention and support services. Funders need to balance the investment in prevention and support. Real prevention is supporting people. Real support is prevention. You know, we oftentimes see you know, where you know, the funding, um, you know, like even a couple of years ago when um, the funding in, in, in the sector shifted to, um, significantly to, to, prevent, to prevention work, but then there are very minimal support that is given to, um, to help people and support those who are already living with HIV to live healthy and meaningful lives. You know, 40 years into this epidemic and we have not learned this lesson. I don't think, you know, we have not really grasped the fact that supporting PHAs is a part of prevention. Supporting PHAs is a meaningful way through which we are going to really uh, eradicate HIV. PrEP, HIV treatment may be new prevention tools, but they will fail if we only fund prevention and not support. Thank you so much, Gareth, as you're speaking. There's so many things that I could relate to. Um, Dr. Leboucher, I'm wondering what your reflections are on this. Thank you, Gareta. It's uh, it was very insightful for me what we you, you explain on uh, and stigma and how we can engage specific uh, uh, subpopulation to to really to to give their their own safe space for good care, their own safe space to live well uh, with HIV. So, Dr. Knox, I'm wondering from your perspective, what is this you hear and how you assist your patients in in working beyond that. I'd say the one thing I do try to direct people to is peer-to-peer -peer counseling. I think there's something very powerful about speaking to people with lived experience. Linking patients to these services after a patient's been newly diagnosed has been very challenging recently. I feel like we can do so much better. This has been great. Again, thank you to the panelists and thank you for Gilead Canada for bringing us all together. We will now be moving into the live Q&A section. So see you all soon.